So we're late because I had technical difficulties. Technical difficulties. I want me to turn it this way so they can see who they're talking to. They got technical difficulties. I'm sorry guys, that was my bad. I got my timer. I'm going to set my timer now because we keep going over. <laughs> so I'm going to give us an extra couple minutes. Just I'm going to give us extra five here. So 35 minutes. Ready? Go. Okay. Uh, okay. We're going 35 minutes today. <sighs> we're trying to be good. We don't want to keep you guys forever. So I guess we'll just jump right in then, yeah? Okay. Okay, here well, we yeah, go. Congrats on our 10th broadcast. Has it been that many? I guess so. We need to start touting. Oh my god. Then we can have celebration like a hundred. What, like have cake in front of everybody and Maybe. like not invite anybody to have cake with us? Yeah. Or like put it in the broadcast notes like, hey, go get yourself a cupcake and join us with cake tonight. That's right. That's right. <laughs> we should do that. That'd be good. Okay. All right. What okay. do we got? All right. First question of the night is from Brian. Brian. He wants to know, what happens when a name that has been reserved for the temple work hits the two-year limit? Does the name turn green and become available, or is it automatically shared with the temple? All righty. What happens when the two-year reservation release happens Yeah. is it will, um, right now we're doing it manually. Eventually we're going to make it automatic, but it's not there yet, so we've been manually doing it. So we've been doing it in about November time frame. And what we do is we essentially unreserve the ordinance so it becomes Green Temple. So anybody can Anybody can it? reserve it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it doesn't automatically go to the temple, it just is. Does green not for go reserves. to the temple right now, it just unreserves and turns green arrow. Now, you know, I'm investigating whether that's the right thing to do. That's what we've done for the last two years. Okay. So we did it two years ago and then last year. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you know, I, I didn't like the results that were there, so we're investigating whether we should be doing something else. But that's what we do right now. If it changes, I'll let you know. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. Mm -hmm. All right. So there you go, Brian. Okay, question number two for the night is from Mary Cozy. She wants to know, when considering the improvements for notifications, when are you watching, um, when you are watching someone, would it be possible to eliminate the notification when I make a change to someone I'm watching? Seems like a like it shouldn't be difficult to put an I put a like an if then statement <laughs> <laughs> and to remove my own family search username and cut out cut down some of the emails in the system. Yeah, I appreciate I appreciate you uh, writing our code. <laughs> so let me just you know tell me let me just explain how the watch notify works. Yeah, tell us a little bit of the. And it's it's more complicated than you think. Imagine it and is. so we would appreciate your tolerance if you get <laughs> notified when you watch it. Um, Here, let me scoop this back so you guys can see it. Oh, there's plenty of room, plenty of room. Is that good? Yeah. Can you see everything? Yeah, I'm not going to use the whole board anyway. Well, so I just you get a little while with the You may want to come up a little closer. But. Okay. All right, so this is Family Tree. Okay. And this is a database of changes. That doesn't look very good. That looks like chicken scratch. Well, most of your handwriting right, is chicken scratch. Do you want me to no, do that? No, no, I, I can do better. Look at that. Well, that's like almost like elementary school grade handwriting. That's pretty good handwriting. That is sweet that's stuff right there. Sweet. Okay. Okay. So what so happens family is... family tree over here and yeah. then changes over here. So yeah, so what family happens? tree is hitting here and we have a database that has... This is the uh, notification database. It's a separate database from the change log that you get over here. Okay. They're separate. Okay. And what happens is this, anytime a change is made over here in Family Tree, we send a message over to this database. Mm -hmm. And in this database, we just say, oh, this PID, remember every person in the tree has a PID. Right. And we just store, oh, these are the changes for the PID. Whoever, we don't record who made the changes. Just... We just record the changes. Okay. So imagine... You know, that's happening, you know, I, I would imagine on a Sunday, this is probably running at about 50 to 60,000 changes every hour. On a Sunday, and Sundays are your most busy days? Right, right. Okay. So it's probably 50 to 60,000 changes an hour. You imagine a merge, that's even bigger. <laughs> and so there's 60, 50,000 of those shoving into this database uh, every hour. And so we don't keep track of who made the change. We're just trying to keep up and keep track of what changes were made. Okay. So then we also keep, when you put in your watches, we have another database that has a list of your watches. And it, here's a list of all your PIDs in the watches. 
And then what we do is then when it's time to send you a message because it's been a week, we just go out to this database here. We collect all of the data for the PIDs that you watch and put it together in an email and send it to you. So imagine, you know, so out of the, you know, millions of changes that happen in a week, millions and millions of changes a week, we didn't want to have to have a name of each person that made those changes over here. So sorry. So, we didn't implement it. It's a little more complex than you would think because you're thinking of, we think about it as one PID, but in reality, this is every PID that's changed in the system over time. So, uh, um, certainly, I believe that, well, yeah, so that's why it doesn't do it. I agree that it's kind of annoying if you're the only person changing the, <laughs> changing the person and, and you, you get an email that says, hey, some... Ron Tanner changed these things, and I'm like, I know that I'm the one who made the change. I Hello, get it. Hello, doofus. System. I get it. I get it. <laughs> Sorry. The team knows that that people don't like that to get notified, and it is kind of annoying. But uh, we just haven't spent the time to get down to that kind of detail to be able to remove those. You're more interested in bigger and better. Yeah, I'm more interested in in fixing bigger problems than telling you that you changed something you already knew you changed. Sorry. Maybe we're trying to help you remember and nah. keep your memory fresh. Well, no, I'm sorry. We just did it. Oh. I was trying to give you a good excuse. No, got none. Sorry, Let's Mary. go to the next one. <laughs> okay. And she, oh, she wants to mention also to keep up the live broadcasts. They are very helpful. Oh, okay, good. I'm glad. Keep telling us that this is good. If you're sick of them, tell us you're <clears throat> sick of them. We'll quit. But uh, we'll just keep going if they're useful. Yeah. Oh, really fast. Debbie Petty, Debbie Petty wants to know, is the Family Search Research Place database going to come back oh the research place yeah i did see on get satisfaction recently that it's disappeared um yeah the question she wants to know Debbie, if it's going to come back is where are you looking at research places there's two urls for those places one is on labsfamilysearch.org that one's probably going to go away like permanent? No. Permanently. Okay. But we have a new location for the places, and I can't remember what the URL is. I, I'll make a note for you. But we have a new place where you do place research, and it's not under labs.familysearch.org. places. So I don't URL. know if I have that. Uh, let's see. You really want to look for it right now? I'll just look while you're looking for the next question. I have it right here. Okay, it's called, go, go here yeah. and see if it works. Okay. FamilySearch.org right FamilySearch search slash research, research slash places. If it works, I'll post it in the group for you. Yeah, it works fine. So you need okay. to go to FamilySearch.org and don't put FS. I better write that out. Here, I, I'll write it. I'll post it for you in the video link. Debbie, I'll call it like all um, Debbie. Places, right? Here is the link. There it is. FamilySearch.org slash research slash places. That's the new place for the for place research. Okay? There you have it. Hey, hey. Talk about speedo bandido. Like we aim to please around this place. <laughs> okay, the next one's from Powell. Um, wants to know, <coughs> with curiosity, you've explained that the biggest tree in Family Search has more than 300 million persons together, mm -hmm. and the second and the third and the fourth one? Are they also so huge, that, or are they much smaller because they grow because they're easily absorbed by the biggest one? I know that in my family tree there are a minimum of 20,000 persons, but it would be wonderful to be able to know how many people I'm connected to. Maybe I'm connected to the 30 million person that I just Oh, uh, maybe you, maybe you are. I don't know. You have to think of it like this. Family tree wants to have one, one tree for all of humankind. Yes. And, uh, but trees naturally grow uh, uh, bigger when, when the same people are doing family history. So, yeah. for instance, if, if we're talking about United States, for instance. Yeah. If you just think about the United States and, and people coming over in the Mayflower and then they had kids and they did all that. A lot of the people in the United States are related because uh, they came from came from the forefather forefathers or something. Mm -hmm. And people in you know people in Korea are related, and people in Europe 
A lot of people in Europe are related, France and Germany, so like that. Yeah. So what happens is trees start to grow in these countries as people in the United States, for instance, to all work with family tree, mm -hmm. then they start tapping into these lines. Okay. And same with Europe, they tend to tap together in a line, and Korea, and so you may have people in the U.S. that are, have Korean ancestry, so they may tap in the U.S. a little bit, and they branch off down to Korean because they have Korean ancestors or Chinese or whatever. European, a lot of U.S. families, you know, you get before the, you know, back into the 1700s, and you, a lot of them are English from England mm. or Scotland or right. Ireland or something like that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, so it all depends on who you're related to and what the, <laughs> that set of people are doing family history. Mm. So what I was saying is the largest single tree actually is in the U.S. And, uh, and that when we count, we count up and we count down. Because everybody, everybody that's connected, and it's at 384 million right now. And I don't know where the second place one is. I'll have to see if I can find that out. Okay, so Paul, I will, I have to remind him. Yeah, because I, I got too many things. Because he's brain damaged. Yeah. Um, so I so will I don't know if I can get that. The second, third, and fourth biggest trees. Yeah, I, I have to, we have to have our research team help us out with that. And so I'll have to go ask them if they can do me the second one or the third one. We'll definitely ask them about it. Yeah, Let's no guarantee. But I asked about the biggest one, and they kind of keep track of the biggest one. Because well, that's the I one mean, that's it's like most... an interesting fact. Yeah. I mean, why and and we're talking about, you know, all the people going up, and then all the down, and all the spread out, and all the kids, and grandkids, and great-grandkids, all the dead, you know, all up yeah. and down. It's a big tree. So it's a big tree. So that's what that is. All right. Darcy has three questions. Here we go. Her first one is, I have reservations in my temple list that are not becoming unreserved at the two-year limit. Not that I mind, but I was wondering what was happening with that rule. All right. The two-year rule. So hers are not becoming unreserved at the two-year limit. Well, well, you can unreserve it yourself, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think she... Yeah, she's, she's okay that, if it doesn't. She's, she's a mine. So, so the two-year rule that. has to do with the... It, it's the following. One is reserved before May... This is the last one. First, 2016. Okay. And two, no reservations, no completed ordinances... Okay. No ordinance <clears throat> done after May 1st, 2016. And shared with Temple is exempt. I think I have to start writing bigger. Or... Hold it. Yeah. So here's the two-year rule. One, it, it, the last one we did, it had to be reserved before May 1st, 2016. Even okay. though we released it the 20 in, the, in November, we picked a day, and the day I picked was May 1st, 2016. Okay. There has to be no ordinances done after May 1st, 2016. So the idea was, if even if you reserved it before May 1st, but you worked on it, after you reserved it, uh, or after May 1st, it means you're actively using this card, so we didn't want to have it just disappear for, on you. So if you had an ordinance done, so here you reserve BCIE, ba Baptism Confirmation, Initiatory, and Endowment. If you did the baptism after May 1st, then we won't release it because we figure you're working on the card and you'll finish it. Yeah. And then the other one, of course, remember, is anything that's shared with the temple is exempt from being released. So it still shows on your reservation list, but in your shared section, and we don't touch anything that goes through the temple. We don't unreserve those. So that's the rule. Um, if we do it manually, we want to automate this and show you the actual date that it's going to be released on the reservation list. We want to show that and then warn you and say, hey, this is going to be unreserved in two weeks or something and send you an email. But And that's one of the things we want to work on this year. We hope to get it so this year or early next year that. Then this will all go away. We won't do the May 1st. It'll just be unreserved on the anniversary of when you reserved it. But the same rules will apply if you haven't done any ordinances on it. Then it sort of restarts the clock. Gotcha. But right now, this is the way it is. So if we were to do it again next year, 
we haven't got that work done, automated mm -hmm. work done, then we'll, in November we'll release anything that had the reserve before May 1st, 2017. Got it. Got it? Got okay, it. Okay, that's the rule. So that's why they probably didn't disappear from your list even though you expected them to do. Okay. one of those. All right, question number two from Darcy is, I have noticed that when I change the gender on an individual, then the temple work becomes unavailable. Yep. Does that eventually change? What is the best way to handle a gender change that has to be made? <clears throat> okay. So what she's talking about is, here's a person who's listed as a male. Okay. And uh, if it's a male and you just change it to female, there's not a problem. It just works and everything's fine. But if they have an ordinance, so let's say I did the baptism and I did the confirmation as a female. Okay. I did those ordinances. You see it okay? Yeah. So I did these ordinances as a female. Okay. And then somebody comes in and says, well, hold a minute. This wasn't a female. It was a male. And they change it to male. Yeah. Then these ordinances over here are invalid. Because they were done for Because they were female. done for a female. And the ordinances for male are different than the ordinances for female. Correct. So they're not valid. Okay. So what we do is we mark we, we mark this as, uh, as got some in invalid stuff on it. And we say, and we put on the screen, not available. And that's what she's seeing. Not available. And uh, the only way to have that not available go away is to uh, contact support right now and say, hey, this is a mail. And so I corrected it. We send an email, by the way, to support and tell them that we did this. So they got a list of those that are getting changed. And if you want to take these as a male, because this is really a male person and you want to get it done, mm -hmm. you need to contact support or send a support case, give them the PID of this person, and say, hey, this person was really a male, and I can't reserve the ordinances because it's not available, and they'll go look in here and see these two ordinances, and then they'll invalidate them. Okay, they'll, they'll release them. They'll so they make them reach. invalid, and then they'll turn that off, and then they'll show up as green arrows. Gotcha. Green temples. Okay. Okay? So that's the only way right now is to contact support in order to get that changed. And they're pretty quick. They did do it, I don't know. I would think it would happen within a week or less. I'm sure they got a lot on their they plate. They got a lot on their plate, but they're pretty quick. When it comes to temple stuff, they try to be careful. So that's why the not available has to happen because we got to have somebody check this to say, is this legit? Yeah. And we have to invalidate those ordinances. We can't leave them around as valid ordinances because if the person was really a male and we did them as a female, then these are no good. And we have to mark them as no good. Right. So Makes sense. that's why the admins have to get involved so they can mark it as no good. Makes sense. Okay? Okay. That's why that happens. Last question for Darcy. Three? Yeah, I told you she had three. Oh, my gosh. I know. She's sneaky. She, she's very sneaky today. Uh, I'm becoming discouraged dealing with a certain user on family search who does not pay attention to sources, explanations, or discussions, and puts back incorrect relationships shortly after I fix things. I have tried messages, discussions, explaining why I'm doing things in great detail, tagging sources, and contacting family search, but nothing is working. What is your advice on how to deal with this? Yeah. Uh, you know, I sometimes I'd like to get support involved in this yet, but they're not quite ready yet to be too fully engaged in, in this kind of disagreements. What I recommend is uh, examine what the person is, how they're changing it. So let me let me explain a, a case that happens a lot. Okay. I think most cases are this. Okay. So what happens is you have a line, and I'm just going to draw a line like this. You got a line coming up to an ancestor. This is your ancestor. And you're like, this aunt, that's probably not a very good picture. That, that's that, probably that looks... Picture. That looks We're like, not taking anatomy class. Yeah, here, that's sort of inappropriate. Yeah, picture, well, so let me draw this a little bit different. That, that just got a little like R-rated there. <laughs> Bring it down. This is a family show. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I realized that when I did it. <laughs> my, your mind. I'm just kidding. It's been a rough day. I know. I'm, my mind is clean. That's why I don't think about and it. And it's been a rough week for you. You've had a lot on your plate. I yeah. know. Okay. 
<clears throat> okay, so, so we're talking about how to deal with difficult people changing the staff. Yeah, usually what happens is this. Okay, tell us what happened. Here's you. This is me. And this is evil them, right? My the evil person that keeps changing that's all my right. stuff this is that, that I'm really is, mad at. That's right, this is the evil person. Okay. So this is bad Sam. Bad Sam. Here we'll give him uh, like a little horns because we don't like them right there now. You go. <laughs> so there's bad Sam. Okay. And and they keep changing stuff, so that's why he's bad. And Got here's it. you. And you go to this ancestor and you look at this ancestor and you need to look and see what's the matter with it. So uh, a good clue is if bad Sam over here keeps wanting to put a different set of parents. So here's here's your set of parents over here. So this is you and you and this is bad Sam mm -hmm. that keeps wanting to put these parents on or different sets of kids. Then that's a clue for you to understand that what's going on is Maybe there's two there. lines, two lines have gone, this is, he's going up this line, and someone's connected into a different line, mm -hmm. and he's trying to make this ancestor fit his description. Right, so he's going on here and says, well, this ancestor had these two parents and had these kids, why is somebody sticking these in this? So they want to remove these because they're not theirs, mm -hmm. and they want to remove this kid because it's not their kid. Mm -hmm. And then you turn around and change it all back, right? Because you say, because you're going up your line and you want to make it look like your ancestor. And so you come up and get rid of their stuff. So you got to look and see what kind of changes are you're arguing about, right? So this might be, like if it's so, a case like that, it might be time to split that that's person right, that's and right. create two different people. Right, so if this is happening and you got one line that wants to change it to look one way and your line you want it to look a different way, then what you do is you go make a duplicate person. Of this person. Person. Right, go make a duplicate. Go over here and make a duplicate and hook your line into that duplicate and add, and your add, you, add these parents to that to that person. Mm -hmm. And any data over here that belongs to yours, put over here and then put a between these two, put not a match, put a not a match, not a match, put a not a match between these two so they won't be merged or given a suggestion to merge. Right. Yeah, it won't suggest them that they get merged. So then that and then what happens is they can change this to be like their ancestor, and you can change it like your ancestor, and you're both happy. Right. If the problem is around, um, you know, whether the birth date's the same, you'd have to just look and see how much they're changing it. If they're changing this person radically different than your person, then it's probably this case. And so you need to split them. Hmm. Now, a lot of times they'll say, well, what about ordinances? So here's ordinances sitting over here. Mm -hmm. And the ordinances were done for this person. So you can do that too. You can contact support and say, this PID I split and put over here my ancestor because this is two that were combined that shouldn't have been yeah. merged. Could you move my ordinances for my guy? And by the way, this is the temple and the date they were done. And put them on my guy and they'll move those ordinances over here. They'll so take care of it for you. They'll take care of it for you, so it's all done. Okay. So, uh, so I'll leave it at that. If it's not that problem, then send us another question again with a little more how they're changing it, and we'll go from there. Does that make sense? That drawing looks horrible. Hopefully you've got it figured out. Well, hopefully they will. Bad Sam's line. <laughs> She's watching. Your <laughs> line. This is a thing you argue about. So you're splitting them. Then you're going to split them by just making a copy. Making a duplicate that's your do yours so that you make your yours as clean and beautiful. Yeah. And leave all the mess over here on this one because they should be responsible to clean up this one to make it right. Okay. Okay. That's fair. All right. Next question is from Shanna. And she wants to know in recent discussions about adding living to family tree provided two answers from support. One said, Actually, when someone passes away, their account is shut down, so no one can log in and then mark living people as deceased after the person passes away. It is best to realize that the majority of living people you put in the tree won't ever see the light of day for anyone else. It's been an ongoing issue, it's been an ongoing issue that I've seen where people are creating records of sources, but when doing so automatically marks them as deceased. Another person said, eventually the records added to the family tree will become public if the dates are added. We don't want to lose the information readily available to the living people that are and taking the time to enter the information. Living records added by a person who then dies are not automatically deleted. Ron, what can you shed some light on to this for our future enhancements? Whoa. 
That's like big lot of stuff coming out of your mouth. Whoa. That was so, a big question. It sounds like she called in to support or she contacted support on two different occasions. One person told her that the account shuts down and none of the stuff gets seen by the light of day. And another person told her that it doesn't disappear because they don't want to lose the information. But as dates are added, the information will become available to the living people. So which one is the more correct information? Uh, well. <laughs> Or is it a combo of the two? Yeah. He's getting all fancy on us, guys. Okay. So when you come to Family Tree, there's the living sort of area mm -hmm. and the dead area. And dead is public, so everybody can see it. Correct. And the living is private to the person who has the account. Correct. So... And the reason they're private is because it's against the law for us to, to do to share do, to share, yeah, share that. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. So you're saying, you know, here's grandpa. This is grandpa's living area. So he logs in, he sees this as his tree, and mm -hmm. he goes up. Okay. Then grandpa dies. Okay. So grandpa dies. Okay. And it is true that grandpa's account is disabled. We have to do that because He's not logging into it, and well, we don't want somebody else to log into it. We don't want anybody hacking their account and That's putting right. weird, funky information. Right, or them. impersonating them. Right. By putting bad things up here that you think it's Grandpa's doing it, and Grandpa not uh, there, you know. That reminds me of some lady. <laughs> she got an email or something. There was an email that her husband sent or something, and he died. Uh -huh. And then all of a sudden, like, uh, I remember, I can't remember the details, but it was something like a month later she got this email. In her thing from her husband. From her husband. Oh dear. She's like, ah, oh, you know. He's he, back from the dead. Yeah, he's he's talking from the other side. <laughs> oh dear. So it's true that this grandpa's account is disabled. Okay. The living still are there. We don't delete anything. Okay. And um, and as you know, as a rule, we say if it's a hundred and ten years old, then you can mark them as dead. 110 year old. If they're 110 years old, you can safely assume they're dead. That's not always true, but that's what we use as our general rule. You're a marker. So we're, we haven't done it yet, but we're toil toiling. I'm toiling with the idea of running that 110 year. We have a program that we run mm -hmm. that goes and finds out anybody in the tree who's 110 years or older. And it would look in the living and, and him. And in the dead. Well, these are all dead, so it doesn't matter. So, so just run in the living right. section. Right, and if we find anything that's 110 years old, then we'll kill them. And then when, as soon as you mark them dead, they appear up here now. Okay, so that would mark their account as dead? So no, not their account. It. it would be the people in here. Oh, that, what they created. So he created a bunch of living in here with his grandkids and all that kind of stuff. And what we would do is if this one here is 110 years old, we'd mark that person as dead, and so it's up here now. So they'll show up over there. Got it. Makes sense. Um, so that's what we're thinking about doing. Okay. I will tell you that we are also wanting to do, and this we talk, I talked about this in our in my Roots Tech thing. We also want to share living. We want to provide a way for people to share living. We did talk about this. So if you have shared living, so here's my living area. Here's my spouse's living area. Here's my kid's living area. Mm -hmm. The idea is that I go create a living area for my family, and then I invite, I, I put my living stuff in there. So here's my living people in here. And I invite my spouse, and she puts her living people in here that she put in. And then my, you know, my children and stuff like that, and they put their living in here. So all of the living of the whole family is in one place. And all of us have access to that place. So no matter who dies, so, everybody still has access to the information. That's right. So even if Grandpa's account goes away and nobody can get in there, uh, okay. it's, it's all here. Grandpa's information is still in the shirt. All of it's right. here and you get to keep those living people. Okay. Um, another thing that we're talking about is uh, bequeathing. Mm. And that's another discussion we're having where you can say, I want to bequeath my living area to this person. And then when there's proof of death. death, either because a membership clerk marks you dead or because yeah, you supply a death certificate, mm -hmm. then we will grant this person, whoever they said, will get access to that living area. And then they can do whatever they want there. Okay. So those Nothing, are sort of... official yet. Yeah, those sort of are ideas, certainly right now. 
Yeah, so those are all our ideas about what to do. Does that answer your question? Um, yeah, I think so. Okay, I think that tells you kind what of happens when they count, when they die. So and it's it tells disabled, you nothing's lost though. That's, nothing's lost. We don't want to lose any information. That's right. Um, but what happens it, with the information is still up in the air for what? Yeah, exactly whether it gets bequeathed, whether... It, we're shared gonna we're living. gonna do the living shared living. We're going so to do that. Shared living is happening. We're not. I don't have a date for when it's done, but we're going to do that for sure. Okay. And if people use that to share living with each other, then you know they have all. There's multiple people have the same information, so there's right. nothing really invisible Lost. anymore. Okay. David Farstead wants to know: Could ordinance activity be added to the changes to people and watching report and the weekly email? Uh, <laughs> That's, that sounds like a loaded question. Or yeah, well, like he's that. saying can uh, ordinances. Uh, the answer is it's possible. The We actually do, when ordinances are done, we actually put an entry in the change log when we hook an ordinance to somebody. Okay. But we don't currently notify anybody about those kinds of changes. And the reason why is we haven't done the work to know whether or not you're a member or a non-member when it comes to watches. watches. Makes sense. So we haven't done the work to say, oh, well, because I'm not going to send an email and tell a person who's not a member of the church. I don't want to uh, send a message to them and say, hey, um, an ordinance has been done on this person if they're not a member of the church. Right. So that's, that's not, I'm not supposed to do that. Same reason I don't show ordinances right now to, non to people that aren't members of the church. But then, but we'd like to tell you that the ordinances were done. So uh, I got two concepts. One, we can just change this, uh, the change watch, so it'll tell you that. But I also think I've been toying with the idea of an ordinance watch. Mm -hmm. So you can watch a person for changes, or you can watch a person for ordinances. Mm, that'd be smart. And then, uh, and only members would be able to do that kind of watch. Right. So we wouldn't have to figure out who's a member or not a member. Sure. And then uh, you could do that on people that you don't care whether the birthday change or the name change or whatever. You just want to know when that ancestor gets their ordinances done. Right. And if we do the ordinance watch, then when the ordinance gets done, we'll just send you an email that tells you this ordinance was done and here's the date and the temple that it was done and the ordinance that was done. So I kind of, I kind of even though it's an extra watch, I kind of lean towards that direction. So let us know which way you lean. I mean, would you rather just stick it in the in the normal watch emails, or would you like a separate watch uh, ordinances that the you can do? Yeah, you know, next an extra email if you're watching the person, but if you're not watching them for changes, you just want to mark your line and say, "I want to know when the ordinances are done there," or maybe you share it with a temple and you want to say, "I want to know when the ordinances are done." Then it'll send you an email with the information about the ordinance, where it was completed, the date, the temple, things like that. So okay. let us know which one you'd like. Yeah. Everybody out there. Oh, Jill says she'd like a separate one. She wants a separate one. I'll put a I'll put a poll in the group for the rest of you guys that aren't watching live, and we'll let you guys vote this week and see what you think. So, okay. um, he would like to know too. What is one thing that you wish that the Ward Temple and Family History Consultants would teach, explain, or emphasize better to people who are just starting out with family tree? Ah, that's easy. Like a little tip. Well, for the biggest thing, the biggest problem that I see with new people that come in the family tree is they don't understand that it's a shared common tree. The biggest problem I see is people come and they think it's like Ancestral Quest or Roots Magic or My Heritage or Ancestry.com where every person has their own private tree. And then they get mad when somebody changes something in their tree. So I think you need to... There, I think the first thing we need to make sure they understand is this is a community tree. We all change, we can all change the data and we affect each other. When you change this ancestor, you're going to, you're going to affect everybody who's tied into that ancestor. He's going to see that change mm -hmm. and they're either going to be happy with it. Or they're going to not going to be happy at all with it. So you need to be careful when you make changes. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I want them to understand is uh, when I talk about newbies, and beginning people, when I do presentations for beginners, I tell them there's three things they need to always do in the tree. Okay. And I say one is, there's three things. Two is, uh, 
he's drowning in it's three and talking to himself in case you're wondering yeah i'm talking happens. to you but i'm not telling you everything <clears throat> yes I have a little okay bit. i tell you <laughs> I, when i tell new people i always say there should be three things you're always doing in family tree mm -hmm. the first is explore don't be so caught up in hurrying up and entering things or finding a name that you don't learn about your ancestors. Oh, time's up, but we're going to finish here. Let's finish. Uh, it, it's not... You, you, one of the most important things is to learn about your ancestors. And I believe the reason why we should learn about our ancestors is because we understand the struggles they went through. And that helps us today to be better people and better members because... We want to be like our ancestors, or we want to be not like our ancestors. <laughs> so if we got bad ancestors, we say, we don't want to be doing that. We want to do something better. Or if we got an ancestor who did something great, we say, we want to be like that. Just like the tanners, you know. We have our things that you're expected to do as a tanner, and that's because John Tanner, six generations ago, did that. And that's, that's what we're to do, too. So it becomes a good example. So wander around and explore. I mean, every day... There's more people added to the tree. There's more stories. There's more photos. There's more information. So every day, spend a little time just wandering around and learning about your ancestors. Two, while you're wandering around, looking and checking out stuff, make it better. So if there's a hint there, now what I would do, recommend as a family history consultant, Temple and Family History Consultant, is that if you're teaching people, start with the 1940 census. Just okay. go say, go look at the 1940 census, and let's hook the 1940 census. Why do I say the 1940 census? Because it has people in there that you know. And then you can say, oh, there's my mom, or there's my grandmother, or aunt or, or, aunt or uncle, and I know them. So now you say, oh, I see what records are for. Records are about families and censuses, and they're about birth and death. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see what a record does. I see what a family is in the census. And then have them attach it to their ancestor to make it better, okay? okay? But start with early. Don't jump up into the 1700s or 1800s <laughs> because they don't even know what a source is yet. Mm -hmm. So make it better. And so you're wandering around, you run across a hint, make it better. Or you run across an ancestor that you remember. Well, then stop right then and write a story about that ancestor because that's the cool stuff that inspires people later on, right. you know? My my Gigi, my my Granny Martin, who had a house that uh, used skeleton keys, was how she opened her front door, and that was I thought that was so cool when I was like <laughs> nine or ten years old, and I started collecting skeleton keys. He still has them all yeah. the way. Yeah, and she like she like had fake teeth she didn't like to wear, so she stuck them in a glass on the windowsill next to her sink in the kitchen, and they're floating in there. Gross. And and she chewed gum in her mouth, and I remember she had big old packs of gum in her mouth, and I loved it because mom and dad only let me have one piece of gum, and I wanted to have a whole mouthful. Mm -hmm. And she had a whole mouthful, and I asked her why, and she says, because she likes to eat her steak, so she wanted to have tough gums. She likes to eat her steak without, without her, her teeth. teeth. She hated her teeth, so yeah. she chewed the gum. She chewed the gum to make her gums tough so she could eat steak. Right. And she had that big old grandma feather bed, you know, that I ran down the hall and fly in the air, land, and just sink, you know, <laughs> sink into it it was great i need to write that story when i find it when i get to her and i need to write about it right then so i don't forget mm -hmm. and that's a great story for people in the past you know going down yeah they read that and say wow that is so cool and i have a picture of her i have a picture of the key and and so like that. and then the third thing you should always do is you're going to run across some hard spots you're going to find, find a spot where you have too many parents too many kids, somebody with extra spouses. And then that one, you just learn to spend time about sources. But you should already know a little bit about sources because you saw some here in the, in the making it better. Yeah. So now you get a little hard spot, and that hard spot can happen in you know late 1800s, which is a good time to look for sources, mm -hmm. and you can help teach them. So I want them to always do every three because every experience with Family Tree or Family Search is a pleasant experience because... I celebrate, I found cool stuff today, mm -hmm. and by the way, I added three stories and a picture. Wow, that's amazing. Tomorrow I come back, I explore, find one more cool thing, didn't add any pictures, but I went and searched for a little while for a couple of sources to help me with this hard problem to find this family. And then I got tired of the hard problem, so I looked around and found another one and wrote it there. So that was a successful day, because I figured out, found something I didn't know, I made something a little bit better, and I still work on this once in a while. So... 
That's what I'd like them to learn. The tree is shared by all. It's open edit for everybody. And, uh, and to always spend time exploring, making it better, and, and then work on hard stuff. Yeah. And if while you're doing that, I, bet you, I guarantee you that while you're doing these things, you're going to find temple opportunities. Because as you're making it better, you'll find a source that adds somebody. Or you break open that hard spot, and you'll find some. And you'll find some ordinances to take to the temple. Great. I also recommend that if you're a fam temple and family history country, uh, consultant, <laughs> that you do the find, take, teach approach and go look at Mike Sandberg's presentations. They were recorded last year. I think they might even record it this year, this last week's day. But he developed a model that works amazingly well to get people have a great first time experience. They find a name very first time. And then the second time they're more willing to meet with you to, to learn some more. And that's when you learn about, you know, nineteen forty census the second time or the third time you come together. So I encourage you to do that as well. All right, so well, okay, should so we I go have, on a little bit longer? I have a question. We only have two questions left. All do you right, want to we'll, finish we'll off? Try. Let's try. I've been trying to do be good and I not know. go too well, long. I'm usually the one that pushes and he's the one that stops. <laughs> okay, so Lynette Day wants to know, is it better to have a nickname listed, listed with a full name or as the alternative name? Oh, you want the, the vital name to be their birth name okay. or, the, or the most correct name that you can find. So, for instance, if you just know it's Jenny Smith because she was married to John Smith, then put Jenny Smith. Okay. And then nicknames are also known as, or maybe uh, in one record they put, like my mom, uh, they, her name's Lexi, they put Betsy in the 1940 <laughs> census. So I could put in, her name is Lexi, she was also known as Lexi Ann, and I could also put an alternate name and say she was known as Betsy in the 1940 census. And so I'll put all of that in the alternate name, but the vital name should be their birth name. And if it's a, if it's a woman and she was married, you really want to put in her maiden name there. Mm. Uh, because that's where most of the early records will be about her as a child, not as a married woman. Okay. So you want to put the maiden name there. So that's what I recommend. So maybe put um, her married name as an alternate name, perhaps? Yeah, you could put her married name as an alternate name, or maybe they called her Lizzie. Or you like know. how you said your grandma's name was Granny Martin, she could be an alternate name That's right. Granny Martin. That's right. Okay. The alternate name is a good place to put the way she was recorded in other records. Maybe she had a nickname. Maybe she was known as this in journals. And it's, that's just her alternate name or nickname. Okay. Um, also, Lynette, you mentioned that we could do a shout out for Family Search Research Communities on their Facebook pages for Canada and stuff. I'm going to reach out to you. I'm going to send you an email. I would love to connect with them so that they could be a part of this and help us. Yeah, they have a Facebook further. page for research communities where they try to get volunteers to help people find records about different areas of the world. So I would love, I would love to connect with you on that and <coughs> see how we can work to, <coughs> work together. Okay. With them. One so, more, right? Last one. Last one for the night. Susan Mangum wants to know. I have a friend who's adopted by a stepfather. He has set his preferences for his stepfather, not his biological father. Yeah. When he sees the blurbs about Mormon pioneers in his family, none of his stepfather's ancestors show up, but all of his biological ones do instead. How can he get it to show just his stepfather's ancestors as well? Um, oh, just show his stepfather's ancestors as well as his biological ones. So he was adopted by his stepfather. But when it shows blurbs about his pioneer So when it sends him emails, I'm assuming, about pioneer heritage. I'm guessing it only shows his biological family, not his stepfather's ancestors. So, does, is this, so my question is, is, are his stepfather's ancestors pioneers as well? It doesn't say. So should we assume that they are? If they um, are, then how can they remedy that? Well, I have to go check because I, I don't believe that those are marketing campaigns done by another group. Okay. And I do not believe that they're checking to see whether or not it's biological or step or foster or anything. <laughs> they're just looking to see if the, who's the living person that's related to this person. How you're connected. So my guess is that they're... Now remember that the pioneer is not exact. We have found out that there's lots of pioneers that don't have the mark of being a pioneer. And the, ba the label or badge or whatever, and they don't send them emails about it. Um... So you can call in support and say these are these of my stepfather, these ancestors right here were all pioneers, and let them know and make sure that they're on the list, and then they should get email for whether it's a 
biological or step. So send me a mess, message to know whether or not to check that it's... Uh, I'm sure that they don't look for that at all. I'm sure they just say, is there... They just walk up the line. They just What they do is they find a pioneer ancestor and then they look at all the descendants of that pioneer ancestor into the living area. Mm. And they, they're just looking for children of that... Children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren of that pioneer and any living people that have an account on family search they send them an email that says hey you had a pioneer and this is your pioneer so, so susan send him an email his yeah. email is ron at familysearch.org I'm gonna, and I'm gonna put that up. give him um a little more information maybe the pid of your friend who has a stepfather so that he can go and take a peek at it and I tried to write big and then I ran out of board. <laughs> Ron at familysearch.org. That looks terrible. Um, it's beautiful. It's yeah. got a little curve on it, like natural head flow. So when you read like that, oh, it, so it, it naturally like curves. Yeah, yeah, your head doesn't go like, you know, side to side like that. Well, maybe it does. Maybe it I read like this, like, like a that typewriter. When you're reading, you know? Um, send him an email, give him a little more information, maybe the PID or something like that, so he can go and take a peek at it, and then, um... I'll visit with that team that does that. We can visit with the that. marketing team and let them know that that's a problem that needs to be addressed, so... Okay. Okay, so that Sorry was it we went tonight. over. Let me see how many we went over here, if it tells me. I don't on know. my timer. I think it just stopped, because we didn't do a stopwatch, we did a... Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. Well, so we're over by like 20 minutes. No, because the timer went off like 7 minutes ago. I think we only went over like 10 minutes. Because you said it for 35. That's true. I give us extra 5. You did give us extra 5. So. All right. Okay, so thanks for coming tonight, guys. It was super fun to talk and chat with you. Your questions were super helpful. Um, remember to help encourage new people to come to Family Tree. Invite them to come to the page and ask their questions. We'd love to help anyone from just starting out to knowing tons of stuff I yeah mean, whatever it doesn't matter what the question my goal yeah. is to try to help everybody have a good experience on family search and family tree yep. and understand how to use it so I mean, thanks for coming thanks for participating thank you for even joining yeah. you know we had a few people we've got some a set of people joining and that's just terrific and yep. thanks to, and tell all everybody else to come and check out these uh question and answer sessions because we got them up on our facebook yep and come watch Family History Ron, and they can watch them at any time. They'll be there. So yeah. tell everybody to go there and like us so that they get notified of the future. Yep. Future ones. And we'll plan one for next week, I guess. It seems that you guys like them weekly. I know there's yeah, a couple people that are like, weeks this time. where is everybody? So uh, we apologize. We took a week off. His brother was in town, so we were having some family time. So yeah. Um, but we will plan one for next week, and we'll let you guys know when that happens. So. Okay, thanks. Have thanks a good so evening. Much. See you bye -bye. guys later.